As far as testimonials are concerned, the testimonial is not the testimonial we should have is not a testimonial that what has God done just for me recently. That's important. We ought to have that walking, living, dynamic relationship with God, and we should have an ongoing set of events that we recognize God's hand in our life, and we can communicate that with other people. That should be something we're able to do. But the true testimony upon which we present the good news to others is. Here's where I was. Here's how I learned about Jesus. Here's how he broke through to my heart. And here's how I responded to him and why he has reached me, how he has reached me. And I have confidence in relationship with him. I have peace in relationship with him. I have forgiveness. I have joy. I have love that I never experienced before. There should be an element of those things in our personal testimony. For we are giving witness to the Lord. When the Holy Spirit comes in your life, he comes in your life for the purpose of creating you as a witness for the Lord. And your witness for the Lord is not just what has he done for you personally, the miracles that you've seen in your life, but to see what God has done in bringing you to a living relationship with him. That you know for certain you have eternal life presently. Not just in the future, presently you have eternal life. I grew up in a church similar to what Michael did, and, uh, and he grew up in Alamogordo, uh, New Mexico. I grew up in West Virginia. And in the churches of West Virginia, some of you know this uh, as well, but in, I, I grew up in a church that if you did certain things in certain ways, you were okay. And if you didn't do certain things in certain ways by a certain name on the church building, you were not okay. That your salvation relationship with God rested on your activity and how good you were and how, how well you confessed. And so I knew, I knew sin. When I was six years old, I was convinced I was a sinner and I needed Jesus. Well, no, wait, let me back up. I did not know I needed Jesus. I knew I needed to be baptized, but I didn't know I needed Jesus. Because as I heard the gospel, I heard the gospel this way. Be baptized and be baptized or you're going to burn forever. And I did not want to burn. I remember at six begging my grandfather, would you please baptize me? No, you're not old enough. Finally, I convinced him at eight and a half years old that I was old enough. How I convinced him was I was able to quote the scriptures and give the meaning of baptism in connection to forgiveness of sins and that I could go to heaven. I want to go to heaven. Why? Because I certainly didn't want to go to hell. I didn't want to burn forever. What child does, what adult does, if you really understand that hell is a torment because you're separated from love, from life himself. And I, I did not want that. I remember praying as a kid. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul. To, I didn't pray, but I recited this prayer. And I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I die before I wake, but please, God, don't let me die before I wake. I didn't want to go to hell. And I knew if I didn't get that water sometime, somehow. So I begged them. And finally, gospel meeting, my Uncle Cease was preaching. It was a Monday night. I had my clothes ready in my, my little brown bag. I waited for the second verse of Just As I Am because nobody goes forward on the first verse. I waited till the second verse and then it was my time. I went forward and I took, and my grandfather took my confession. You believe Jesus Christ, Son of God? I do. And I got in the water with him. I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit for the forgiveness of your sins. And I was okay. I went to bed that night so excited because I was not going to burn. I didn't have to pray. And if I died before I wake, I pray my soul, but the Lord my but please don't let me die before I wake. I didn't have to worry about it. But two weeks later, you know, between the time I was baptized and two weeks for Sunday, I think I'd lied. Uh, about crayons on the wall. I don't remember what it was about, but I, I lied. I may have cussed. I don't know. I was eight and a half years old. I don't remember a whole lot about eight and a half. I just remember this. I was terrified that if I didn't toe the line and I stepped out, I was lost. So how is it when you sin, how do you erase that sin? In our heritage, it was you confess before the church. True story. Two weeks after my eight-and-a-half-year-old baptism, I went forward to confess sin and ask the prayers of the church. 
Now, this vicious, vile sinner you're seeing before you this day, I developed through my years the art of true sin, but at eight and a half, I'd, quite honestly, what was I doing? And how responsible am I? I want you to think with me for just a few minutes, because I'm not against children baptism. I think it's okay if a child understands, but not the understanding of baptism and what it's for, but understanding Jesus and who he is. And the commitment that he's making, the child is making. I don't expect an eight and a half year old to decide what you're going to do the rest of your life. Do you? Decide today what you're going to do the rest of your life, eight and a half year old. Decide who you're going to marry at eight and a half. I knew who I was going to marry. Her name was Judy Jones. I'd already kissed her once. And that was true until I met Jana. But Judy, <laughs> but at, at eight and a half, I knew who I was going to marry. But if you'd asked me, who are you going to marry at eight and a half, would you expect me at eight and a half to make that decision? What career are you going to have? Where are you going to live? What kind of house will you buy? What kind of car will you drive? You expect an eight and a half year old to make those decisions. Why? Would you say maturity level? Can anyone say maturity level? of an eight-and-a-half-year-old? We don't expect it, do we? Now, watch this. The one decision that when you make that decision, it will inform you on every other decision you make in your life. I'm going to follow Jesus Christ all of my life. I give Him my heart, my life, my all. I expect an eight-and-a-half-year-old to understand what that means that that decision is going to inform him of every other decision. The most important decision of your life is not who are you going to marry. It's not where are you going to live. It's not what are you going to do if you ever grow up. It's not any of those things. That The most important decision of your life is what are you going to do with Jesus Christ? And I expect an eight and a half year old who's not ready to make these other decisions to make that decision. Now, if you do and you're, you're good with that, great. That's between you and God. I'm just I'm raising a question mark. Well, isn't that the age of accountability? I don't know. Israel was 20. Go back and read Exodus when God said how, how they're going to die in the wilderness and what age level it was. Jesus was 30 when he was baptized. Had he already dedicated his life to God? Sure, that's, that's not the argument. And Jesus wasn't baptized for forgiveness of sins, and we are. Right? He was baptized to fulfill all righteousness. And that takes a whole different lesson. But the point is, at eight and a half, it wasn't that I didn't understand baptism. And that I didn't understand what baptism was for. I just didn't know what, I didn't understand who baptism was into. That it was a decision to follow Christ. I knew I was coming into the church, but I didn't know anything about Christ. So, I mean, it's not that I didn't know anything. Come on, a child who grew up with a troop in a preacher's family, I knew, I knew intellectually things about. Guys, I did not know Jesus, nor did I make a decision for Jesus. It wasn't until I was 18 years old that I heard this message, the message that I'm going to say to you now. And that is this. We don't bury alive people and wait for them to die later, do we? Romans chapter 6 was written to Christians reminding them of the day they became a Christian. In Romans chapter 6, he says, how can we keep on sinning so that God's grace will keep getting bigger? We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? So we, here's a dead person who said, Sin, you're not going to rule me anymore. Jesus, I want you to rule me now. That person is now dead. Right? Dead to himself, dead to sin. Dead to herself, dead to sin. That individual is dead. What do we do with dead people? So it says, the next verse, Romans 6, as all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. Now why did Jesus die? To forgive us, right? Forgiveness is in the death of Jesus. As many of us that were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. 
We were raised by, we, uh, we were buried with him, therefore, by baptism into death. That just like Christ was raised from the dead, we too may walk a new life. The power of that passage is not that he mentioned baptism four times. It said power of that passage, that whole page, is he mentioned death 18 times. What do you think his message is? Baptism or death? His point is you died to a way of life. You made a firm decision in your life. So stop living that way and start living this way. Since you made that decision, don't let sin be the king in your life anymore. Make Jesus king. Turn your physical members to righteousness, not to sin. Because you're dead. And dead people don't respond to the temptations of sin like alive people do. So be alive to God and dead to sin. Logically consider that, would you? That's what Paul said in Romans chapter 6. Now this is the beauty of what I'm saying. There is a certainty of eternal life that you can have. But what I grew up in was that which was very uncertain. Very uncertain. Because you were never sure that you were good enough or you knew enough. Or that you confessed at the right time and the right amount. It's like you're on, you're, you're saved and, and, then, and then you're, because you confessed your sin and he forgave you so, so you're back in line with God. Then you're, then you're lost because you sinned. So you better confess again so you get back on line. But then you're lost again because you sinned. And each time you step off the line, you're not sure where you are. So I asked my grandmother in her 90s, late 90s, I said, aren't you looking forward to being with God? He's going to, you're going to go home. And she said, I sure hope so. I sure hope so. If, you know, if, if I've been faithful enough, I hear in your 90s, you've walked with him for 70 years. There should be an assurance with each of us, a certainty and it's not based on performance or fellowship. That is, church fellowship. You realize that he didn't command what we do? I'm in hot water now, you know, but he didn't. He didn't command us to get together in order to worship him. He commanded us to have fellowship and encourage and instruct and edify, but worship's not mentioned there. So what am I talking about? Your salvation, my salvation, is not resting on your performance. It's resting on his performance. It's not resting on you've done enough, you've done this much, but you're never going to make it. So Jesus fills in the gap. Here's what happens. Let me give you the assurance. And this is the message that you read through the book of Acts. The only account we have of the Christians telling the world about the resurrected Jesus and how to come to him. You recognize that, right? Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John are Jesus is here and here's how he taught and here's how he lived. He was crucified, he was buried, and he was raised again. He ascended into heaven. The Holy Spirit is given, Acts chapter 2, and the message of salvation is now communicated to the world. The only book in the New Testament that teaches what they taught the non-Christian world of how to come into a relationship with him is the book of Acts. So in Acts chapter 2, the very first message after the resurrection of Jesus. This Jesus whom you crucified, God raised and made him Lord in Christ. How would you feel if you found that you had just killed the Son of God and God raised him from the dead and he's king? What would you think? How would you feel? You'd be like they were. You'd be terrified, scared to death. What do we want to do, they said. And Peter said, repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is for you, for your children, for all those who are far off, as many as the Lord our God shall call. Acts chapter 2, 38, 39. If you don't have that memorized, you haven't been in church of Christ long enough. It's not a Church of Christ verse, by the way. This is the message of hope given to the first hearers of the good news that God raised him from the dead. 
If Peter were standing here today, my question is this. Would he tell you anything different? Would he say anything different to you? Wouldn't Peter say to you, when you say, I see the holy, holy, holy God, I see my own sin, I need forgiveness. And you hear this message, change your mind about Jesus. He is Lord. Be baptized in the name of Jesus. You have forgiveness of sins. You have the Holy Spirit. This is a promise of God for you. Would Peter say that to you or would he change the message? I mean, the message in Acts 2 is the same you see in Acts 8, is the same you see in Acts 10, is the same you see in Acts 16, is the same you see in Acts 22, where a man had prayed for three days and three nights, and Ananias told him, after this long time of prayer, and this is a man who had been killing Christians, thinking he was doing God a great service. He's begging God for three days. He's not eating and drinking. This is Saul of Tarsus we're talking about here. Acts chapter 9 and Acts chapter 22. You ready? This man is so torn up inside, he's not eating, he's not drinking, and he's begging God for three days and three nights. And Ananias comes to him and gives him the message of hope. God has chosen you to be his witness. He's chosen you for the same reason. And he said, look, why are you waiting? Get up and be baptized and... Wash away your sins, calling on his name. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And this is the only passage I recognize in Scripture, in the book of Acts, of anybody told how to call on the name of the Lord. It's through the baptism act. Now here's where the world says baptism is not necessary at all. Because you see, you're saved by grace through faith, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So are we saved by works? No. No. Paul said that, right? We're saved for works, but we're not saved by works, by good works. Okay, I'm not saved by works, period. Baptism is a work. Therefore, baptism does not save. Now, syllogistically, that's a valid arrangement for an argument. Each line, each premise must be true for the conclusion to be true. We're not saved by works. Is that true? Baptism is a work. Is that true? No. The Bible does not call it a work, and it is not a work. It's not something you do. It's something done to you. Somebody else is laying you under water and bringing you up. It is not something you do. It's something God does. It is a work. It's a work that God's doing. Colossians chapter 2, verse 12 says that very thing, that having been buried with him, you were raised by faith in the work of God. It is a work that God does. And so the, the question isn't baptism. Again, the question is what happens in baptism. You're raised together with Christ. You're raised together to live a new life. You're buried into the death of Jesus. You're buried into Christ. His spirit is infused in your body. These things are, these things are taught throughout the book of Acts. And by the way, the letters, Romans through Revelation, every letter that mentions baptism to the Christian refers to it in past tense and the benefits that are applied. Like, by baptism and by one spirit, we're baptized into one body. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. Colossians chapter 2, verse 12. Having been buried with him and raised with him by, the, by faith and working of God. Galatians chapter 3, verse 26 and 27. We're children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. That just like Christ, or rather, and all of us who are baptized into Christ, we're clothed in Christ. So you're children of God by faith because all who were baptized into Christ were clothed in Christ. That's a benefit, would you say? You're in Christ or you're out of Christ. And this is a process. Faith and baptism, you're in Christ. 1 Peter chapter 3 is probably most powerful. God saved Noah and his family through water. And that water symbolizes baptism. Is baptism a symbol? The the Bible doesn't call it a symbol. But it is a death, burial, and resurrection. Right? That is a symbol. Who does it symbolize? Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. What's that all about? It's only the good news. That's only the gospel. His death, burial, and resurrection... So your death, burial, and resurrection, you arrange you, you your own funeral, guys. 
You say, I'm going to die and I'm going to live. And God's going to give me the life. I trust him for that. That's what baptism is. It's a trust in God. So the water of the flood that saved eight symbolizes baptism. 1 Peter chapter 3, read it yourself, verse 21. And that baptism now saves you. Not because it cleans up your body, but because it's an appeal to God for clean conscience. Watch. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. The power of the baptism is not the baptism. It's not even the baptizer. You could pay an atheist $50. Let him baptize you or her baptize you. It's not the one putting you under. It's the one going under. That you're going under for the Lord. You're taking the plunge for him. That's what this is all about. So the pressure, Church of Christ children, is not are you going to be baptized and when. The pressure is... Are you going to get serious about Jesus or not? Back to the passage we were reading and then we're done. Ready? 1 John chapter 5. And we're going to see it in verse 13. I write these things to you who believe in the name, you are believing in the name of the Son of God, that you may know you have eternal life. And this is the confidence that we have toward him. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked of him. If anyone sees his brother committing sin, not leading to death, which on August 4th we'll look at, he's this sin that leads to death. He shall ask, and God will give him life. Those who commit sins that do not lead to death, there is a sin that leads to death. I'm not saying pray for that one. All wrongdoing is sin, and there is a sin that lead, does not lead to death. We know that, not here, we know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning. That is, you're, you're born of God, you're not going to make sin the continued lifestyle. Listen, don't play with sin. It'll kill you. It'll enslave you. It'll mess your life over. It'll take you away from God. It it will be the idol of your life. And the evil one does not touch him. We know that we are from God and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. And we are, say these next two words with me. In Him who is true. In His Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. Jesus Christ, the true God, is eternal life. If you're in Him, you have eternal life. Period. Stay in Him. Jesus said over and over, Remain in Me. It is possible for you to walk away. But if you remain in Christ, you're secure. But I don't know everything yet. Of course you don't. I'm not perfectly obedient in my life. Of course you're not. That's why you still need a Savior. That's why the blood of Jesus keeps cleansing. That's why you confess your sins. That's why we have fellowship with one another. Guys, this is, this is like, it's not rocket surgery. What it is, though, is taking the Word of God and simply accepting what it says to be true and then living that out in your life. So the first part of this lesson was simply to to analyze one thing. How do I come to Jesus to begin with? Jesus, I, I surrender. Whether that's coming forward with a bag of clothes We already have clothes in the waters here. We're ready for you guys. If you're ready to be baptized, today could be your birthday in the Lord. But it's a surrender to Him. Not a surrender to baptism. A surrender to Him. Because salvation belongs to the Lord. And He will give that to the one who responds to Jesus. Salvation is living relationship with Jesus Christ. It is not an eternity, not not just an eternity in heaven with him after you die. Eternal life is now with the living relationship with Jesus. That's the good news. 
And that's what I'm offering to you. Will you accept that invitation? We're going to sing this song. And it can be an invitation for you to say, Jesus, I surrender all. I'm ready today to be baptized. I want that assurance. Or there may be something in your life you, you want the rest of the church to, to work with you on and even pray with you about. The, the, the use that song. Let's, let's pray. Lord, today I pray that you'll give us the security of knowing for certain that we have eternal life because of Jesus Christ, who is the true God and is eternal life. We give you thanks for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing.